Hello. Um, good evening. Uh, still good afternoon, maybe, right? So uh, this is uh, this session is uh, focusing the robotics at work. So um, uh, we'd like to dip into the how the uh, robotics startups are uh, deploying their into, uh, technology into the uh, existing business or society or kind of thing. So we have the uh, three awesome speakers from the this industry. So let me kick off with the uh, uh, Cho Chen. How can I, my pronunciation is good? <laughs> so would you like to introduce yourself and then, and then what is business? What are you doing right now? Yeah, my name is, my name is uh, George, Cho Chen. Uh, I'm the CEO of Sesto Robotics. Uh, we are an AGV company, autonomous mobile robotics uh, solutions provider. And uh, we're a tier one supplier to multinational companies focusing primarily in the manufacturing industry. So, uh, so what, what specific industry you are focusing on in terms of operating the, your products? Um, so what, what specific industry you are serving right now? Yeah, so within manufacturing, uh, we are quite active uh, and we are quite strong in the domain of semiconductor. So um, with material transfers in most manufacturing plants, usually the early adopters are the multinational companies and particularly those where they need to transfer uh, high-value uh, payloads. So our robots are essentially mobilized to uh, transfer semicon wafers within the manufacturing plant in the front-end process. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do it pretty much uh, three shifts a day. And uh, the manufacturers are heading towards a lights-out environment. Essentially, our systems are integrated to the back-end, MES system, the manufacturing system. And uh, essentially, you are able to take away the human element of it and uh, automate the entire process. So it ensures reliability, high uptime, and uh, consistency in the delivery of the process. OK, great. Thank you. So next, we move on to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Juliana. Sorry, that. <laughs> I'm sorry, that. Hi, so would you like to do yourself? Hi, all. I'm Juliana. You can call me Julie for short. I'm from SG Innovate, and I hit the talent networking team. Uh, welcome to today's panel, and I think it's going to be an exciting one. Basically, for SG Innovate, what we do is we invest in deep tech startups uh, working on problems that are hard to solve. Uh, we invest in them, we also help them in terms of venture building. We try to get as the resources, not beyond just the money, uh, people and uh, the right opportunities, the right networks to go beyond Singapore even uh, for these startups to succeed. So left and right are the startups that I will be targeting and working with quite closely with. Um, and essentially for the head of talent, all I do is just meet people all day long. <laughs> yeah, to bring them into the deep tech ecosystem, that's one. And the other part is to already work with people in the ecosystem to help them upskill themselves. Um, so basically, George was talking about how robots in terms of manufacturing and things like that. Then the question you need to ask yourself is, how do the humans continue to remain relevant? Mm. What do they need to do that's different from the robot that distinguishes themselves and adds value to the work? So that is the challenge that we are all facing, not just in this society or this generation, but in years ahead and years ago. So that's the topic that we're talking about. And basically at Ash Innovate, we kind of do that in foresight of these are the challenges that will be coming up. Mm, thank you, thank you. So let me ask something before moving on to Grace. Um, so your organization is a part of the Singapore government, right? Yes. So um, you're um, helping instead of using the taxpayers' money, maybe? I am a taxpayer, <laughs> so trust me, <laughs> I will make sure the taxes are well spent. <laughs> so do you have any criteria in terms of the, uh, 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 let's say, which nationality, which company, um, do you have any limitation in terms of helping startups? Okay, so let's uh, distinguish ourselves. Lah, huh? So SG Innovate, yes, we are government-owned. I'm owned by the Ministry of Finance. Having said that, we are also private limited, meaning that we, to a certain degree, decide who are the people we want to work with. Okay, so there must be a technology that's interesting, that's solving a problem and not trying to look for a problem. So there must be something that the startup coming to us has an idea, has a product that meets somebody's challenges and needs somewhere and on a global scale. So beyond Singapore, even beyond Southeast Asia. Um, and these are the things that we work with. 
Of course, there are other parts of government that works with the different startups at various points, be it grants, uh, research funds, etc. Um, so, uh, I guess you could say as a part of government, we, we create a holistic picture. So, there is no one wrong door or one right door policy, right? You just, yeah, if you're uncertain, you can just come to SG Innovate and we will point you in the right direction. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So finally, um, yes, uh, we have one more uh, founder from the another uh, robotics company here in Singapore, uh, who is uh, Grace Cha. So would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Grace. I'm the co-founder of BX. So BX is a spin-off from the National University of Singapore. We primarily specialize in building autonomous maritime systems, such as autonomous surface vessels and autonomous underwater vehicle. So the technology that we have built up is uh, generated out of uh, seven years uh, from 2012 when I was still an undergrad. Uh, and today we are serving primarily um, oil and gas operators because they are the biggest uh, demand drivers uh, in this industry that we operate in. The second type of uh, people that we usually work with will be defense organizations. And then we have um, essentially the broader group will be anybody that is trying to do um, marine inspections. What we want to do is really to disrupt how inspections are being carried out today by automating the whole process workflow. Um, with autonomous robots. We are not talking about uh, tethered robots. We are not talking about remotely operated robots. We are talking about robots that already come with a pre-programmed mission on what they are actually supposed to do underwater. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And we were told that uh, the organizer has uh, set up the uh, um, Strider account so that uh, we can easily take some questions from the audience maybe, but I don't know how to, do, uh, how to handle that. I don't know. Um, maybe someone can help us to do that. But anyway, moving next, uh, we need to move on to the uh, question. So, yes, let me start off with the uh, uh, Cho Chen. Um, so, your company uh, was started off as a, how they say, in house uh, development project in the, um, sorry, <laughs> hop technique, right? So. Uh, but you decided to um, spin off uh, your business from the, the company and then uh, launch, in, uh, launch the, uh, uh, the business as a new startup project maybe, right? So why did you choose that? Why did you, why, uh, did you choose that way rather than uh, keep doing an operation uh, in the Hope Technique? Uh, yes. So for those of you maybe not so familiar with uh, Hope Technique, it's also a Singapore born and bred uh, engineering company. Uh, essentially, the uh, key focus is to deliver innovative solutions uh, for government agencies, uh, multinational companies as well, in terms of prototyping and doing proof of concept. So it's pretty much a project-based business. Um, Sesto Robotics was a mobility business unit under Hope Technique. And uh, after spending about three and a half years as one of the BUs, we decided that the industry is uh, growing very quickly and uh, we needed we probably function better as a separate entity. So the focus of our company is definitely more a product company. Uh, in terms of our expansion strategy is a bit different from the focus of Hope Technique, uh, our previous parent company. So we decided last year to uh, basically spin off and we received as well some uh, financial investor VC funding. So from your perspective, yeah, you raised the money from the investors as well, right? So for... Um, for your from your perspective, uh, as a founder of the uh, uh, startup, uh, spam up from the big companies, so what is your, um, how do I say, exit strategy? Um, IPO or M&A, or there are a bunch of the uh, uh, exit strategy out there, but um, no exception. Every single startup has to explore their exit strategy, as always, right? So what, what is uh, your exit strategy or your... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you take in money from uh, financial investors, as with all startups, um, the financial investors do have an end goal, essentially, of uh, having an ROI on the investment. And, of course, depending on the profile of your investors, some are a bit more patient, and, of course, some are looking for a quicker exit. So, in our case, for Sesto, uh, our financial investors are um, both Singapore-based, uh, government-related, um, GLC-related funds. So I would say they are a bit more strategic uh, than the regular financial investors per se. Uh, but back to your question, I think in terms of exit strategy, 
I think for our kind of business, uh, it makes sense that we are, at some point in time, uh, allied to a larger, maybe automation company that does a uh, more complete suite of solutions, and we can fit in as one of the key components in terms of autonomous robotics technology. Um, actually, there are some precedents in the market whereby other companies from the US as well as Europe uh, have been acquired by larger companies. So I, I guess there's a precedence. Uh, it may be a direction we may head towards in the future. At this stage, we're very happy uh, enjoying um, above market uh, compound annual growth rates. Mm. So in the autonomous mobile robotic space, according to several research reports, the CAGR is about 30 to 40% per annum. So essentially, we're growing faster than that. So we're quite happy to uh, be in this uh, growth phase uh, and explore the future outcomes a bit later. Mm, I see, I see. And um, yeah, I'm a Japanese, I'm from Tokyo. And then, and from my perspective that, um, um, yeah, when we look at the, uh, how the, the Japanese startup doing usually, uh, they started off with the, the, the business uh, in the domestic market and then going uh, thinking about, start thinking about the global expansion or regional expansion. However, uh, both of you, I mean, the uh, VX, VX and the, um, sorry, <laughs> sister of sorry of that. Um, so both of you are based in Singapore, which is a very small country, right? So global expansion or regional expansion is a sort of a mandatory um, approach you think about maybe. So, so what is your plan in terms of that? I mean, uh, do you think any um, um, global expansion or um, regional expansion effort right now? Yeah, so I think first of all, um, the point to make is that Singapore, while it's a small market, but it's a great place to attract talent <laughs> uh, because we are, in a way, a hub for startups these days. And I think uh, Singapore has done a great job. The various agencies and institutions have done a great job to attract uh, talent from dif different parts of the world. Um, so I think Singapore is a great base to start where you can have a team and you attract talent from India, China, Southeast Asia, and so forth. So in our, in our team, we have a large mix of uh, mm. nationalities. Uh, second point to make uh, before we look at expansion, really, is that Singapore does serve as a good platform in terms of uh, having understanding the problem statements out there in industry. The Singapore does have uh, some level of diversity in our different industries, and there are also multinational companies that are based here. Uh, so we have been able to, uh, to get into some of these clients and build reference cases. So for young companies, uh, having a reference, strong reference case is always very important because that's your track record, that's your credentials. And you need that before you can travel, frankly. Right? So even other big unicorns like uh, you know, the Ubers and the Grabs of the world, uh, they also need to establish in their hometown and be the local hero before they can expand overseas like Gojek. So in our case, the same thing. We built our uh, track record in Singapore. Uh, we've already begun to expand in the other big markets like China, where we have direct customers, as well as now we're in the phase of working with partners uh, to reach different new markets, vertical markets, uh, industries, as well as uh, new countries. Mm. Let's see. Okay, thank so you. So for BX, it's a little bit different. Um, even though we are a homegrown, um, we develop our technologies here. Our primary user and, and why we decided to spin out from the university is because we actually got a very major contract from a Thai operator. So our base in development of technologies is here, but our customer is not here. Um, and back to the topic of the panel, which was robotics at work, I think that Singapore is a, is a good place for building a robotics company because for, for the industry that I operate in, um, Singapore faced a manpower shortage in having divers to carry out that kind of um, very tedious and actually very risky jobs. Um, and I feel that it's, um, it's a natural progression for us to move into that area. So I have worked with robotic systems uh, from the US and from um, UK, from Norway. Um, the challenges of what Singapore and Asian countries face is very different from what the waters of the Nor North Sea or um, US look like. Our waters are murky, our waters are green. These are challenges that are not explored in other countries. So the challenges that we face um, on autonomous self-driving and autonomous uh, maritime systems is quite similar. You always need localization and you always need to adapt your solution to that particular market. Yeah. Thank 
you, thank you. So let me ask you, uh, Juliana. So you're probably, you must be an expert at the uh, hiring the people for, uh, for helping the startup hiring people maybe, right? So from your perspective, right? Um, so both of founders from the Robotech startups over here, both of them are uh, local startups. So it's very natural for them to run their startup uh, over here in Singapore. But, um, you know, Singapore is a welcoming the uh, startup from outside the country, maybe, right? So for those of them, um, for, for those, I mean, that are coming from the outside of Singapore, so what will be, um, how do I say, um, the strengths for, um, of the country in terms of hiring the people over here or having an office over here, especially around the robotics industry? Oh, meaning that the strength is... Uh, for for robotics, them? so let's say um, the robotics company, uh, robotics startups maybe, uh, coming to Singapore, when they uh, think about uh, launching their business or hire the people over here, what will be the strengths uh, of the Singapore? What do you think about that? I think just like Chochin said uh, earlier, uh, Singapore is a great place because we have the right folks and the ecosystem that supports it, be it a supportive government, um, the right types of talent. I was talking to Grace before the panel and I can relate to a lot of the issues she brought up because my dad's a captain. And being on the ship all day long, I mean, I hear about my dad's challenges. And it is an industry that is in shortage because nobody wants to go into marine time these days. And the younger folks don't have the experience. So people like my dad, who have lots of experience, need to transfer their knowledge to the younger ones or to the robots. It is dangerous because when they go into the, to the ships, and it's in a, for example, in the tank, right? And they can just die because there's lack of oxygen. So the talent is here, but we need more. So when the startups from overseas come here, they also attract their talent pool. Let's not forget that. They don't come alone. And they come with experiences and diverse uh, knowledge and skills that will complement the local ecosystem. Personally, I feel that having this diverse mix of individuals and ideas, people, resources, uh, obviously in terms of the financials um, and the backdrop of a good Singapore government backing it, uh, has a mix any startup that coming into Singapore and even our local startups uh, attractive, right, and have the best chance of success. Um, so none of the startups that come into Singapore or come from Singapore are going to stay in Singapore only. That's illogical. So the idea is that Singapore is a great place, it's a launching pad, but beyond that, I think we also have the best resources, the right ecosystem uh, to attract different folks with different talents, different skills that complement all the work that we are doing. And if, if you remember what I said earlier, we are working on problems that are difficult to solve. Meaning that it's not going to be one simple solution. You would have a mixture of complex solutions coming together to solve that difficult problem. Yeah. So that's the idea that we were all backing about. Yeah. Most, most people uh, naturally assume that uh, robots that we use today are what they see on the sci-fi movies, right? They can do everything. But actually, when you go down to engineering a vehicle or a robotic platform, um, one thing that AI or the even the cutting edge research have not overcome is the uh, ingenuity of the human mind. And that is something that you can never, or, or I, I believe that you will still need humans in the loop to help the robot become better. Um, in terms of risk, in terms of insurance, nobody is going to believe, or, or nobody is going to um, structure their risk management in a way where there's no humans involved. Um, and engineering robotic systems is all about how to put the human into the loop. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So let me take the next question. Uh, this is uh, this is yes. Um, so Chen uh, advised me to take this question in the stage. Um, uh, most people think that uh, uh, will robots take away our jobs from the uh, humans in the workspace? Uh, we remember that, uh, I heard the name of them, but uh, someone, maybe the professor of Oxford University, has created the list of the jobs uh, which will be eliminated uh, in coming years or something, and maybe 50 or something, I don't know how many jobs there were, there were but actually, yeah, um, some of you guys are familiar with that, actually. So, um, do you have any idea of that, any comment on that? 
Yeah, so that, that can be a controversial question. <laughs> but I think it's something which a lot of, a lot of us need to think through. And uh, so do robots, are robots going to displace jobs from, from humans, right? That's the big question. Um, and I think if you read the reports, uh, you read the papers and journals, there are two distinct camps. So one camp, I would say, are the people that say it's doomsday. Uh, depending on the role you have today, whatever job you're doing, even if you're an accountant or a lawyer or you're a physician, a doctor, a surgeon, some people are saying, well, up to 20 to 30% of uh, these jobs will disappear with robotics and AI, right? And of course, you talk about the uh, more um, blue-collar kind of workers that do operators, uh, that statistics go up even higher. So I think there's definitely one camp which is uh, the, the doomsday kind of scenario. Um, then the other camp, I would say, are the more um, optimists, where they say that the new economy, um, people that have new jobs, and there's an, there's an ability with technology. Technology enables people to kind of um, upskill themselves and do more meaningful roles. Mm. Right? So instead of maybe scrubbing the floor, you have a robot that does the scrubbing of the floor. Instead of pushing things from point A to point B uh, 50 times a day, which is very, very boring and backbreaking, you have a robot AGV that does that, right? So, so there are two camps. Uh, if you ask me personally, I tend to be kind of in between, but I would say I'm veering towards the optimistic view. I think every generation, um, um, people in the digital economy these days, the new generation of folks, they are very nimble, I think. Uh, they're not shackled to traditional job models, I think. So for them, they are, I think, able to evolve and adapt with the new world order, the new technologies that emerge, plus they are definitely more technologically savvy than the older generation. Mm. Of course, the question that's, that's, that'll be asked is what about the older generation? So I think it's really up to every individual level first uh, to try your best to find ways that you can evolve. Do you, right? think, do you think the singularity will definitely come in the future, singularity, when the uh, AI or artificial intelligence take, uh, takes over the people's, uh, people's jobs, that kind of thing. So, do you think the? I think I will jump in. <laughs> Sorry, that. <laughs> because I'm like, yeah, I basically feel um, like what Grace said, right? I, I personally feel that the robots complements the humans rather than take over jobs. Now, if they are taking over your job, then your job is not worth doing by a human. Someone else can do it. I mean, a robot can do it. Why can't the human do something else more complex? You talked about ingenuity, creativity. Now tell me now, even if like 50 years from now, a robot that can do that, even if there's a robot that can paint, write poetry, write music now, but honestly speaking, we connect to human beings, we don't connect to robots. And I think that's important to remember that the robots are there to help us in our work and not really to take over our work. And if they're taking over your work, then your work needs to be taken over. <laughs> It's time for you to change a role, change your scope, go and learn something new, go and figure out exactly what you're good at, and go for it. So in SG Innovate, we have things like, you know, a lot of uh, upskilling courses that you can attend. You know, going for uh, more deep learning type, machine learning type courses that would help you in your future career. For the younger ones, we have summation. And they, that basically means that they go through the, you know, their whole studying life and accumulating that experience, that, that educational experience, into real life, solving real life problems in the startups. So that to me, will the robot replace? The answer is no. I'll give you a classic example. So we have Bash, right? Block Serenai Ayaraja. So that you know anyone who's gone through it, you know, right? You're basically from the MRT to get to Block Serenai, you have to cross the road. So when we first moved there about five years ago, everybody started jaywalking. Mm -hmm. It's a natural human instinct. You just go to the shortest route. Then they started building fences. What did the humans do? Just go around the fence uh, across mm -hmm. to the other side. After a while, they tried planting trees. Everything died, by the way, because the humans just trampled the grass. Eventually, we came to a conclusion, just let the humans cross and the traffic will figure it out itself. And it worked so far, Tashula, no accidents. Um, but that... That's humans, uh, we'll get around it. If there's something, an obstacle, we get around it. And that's how we survived for thousands of years. So even with robots now, I really don't see we'll become extinct in that way. I, I think more of it is really, um, maybe there's more that we can do in helping different generations of people get 
uh, more involved in robotics because it might seem as if robotics um, uh, interaction with robotics is only limited to a select few. Today, the kids grow up and they see robotic vacuum cleaners, they see robotic people, uh, not people, robotic um, tray collectors. Um, but the previous generation, like probably my grandparents, they, they didn't see it. And how, how are we supposed to actually uh, reconcile with this gap? Is there more programs that we can run to get people more involved in robotics and actually understand how the ecosystem is like, understand how a robotic system is like? So I, I believe that understanding is the most fundamental thing that you can do to eliminate people's fear. Only when you understand can you truly not be afraid. And then when you understand, you can manage the risk. If you don't understand, all this is just speculation. And honestly, if you think about it, we have an aging population globally, right? And the idea is that you have robots that can help you in your mobility or even in your daily chores. Isn't that something good? Uh, so just to touch on that, you're right. So in many cases, uh, when we approach customers, uh, one of the big pain points really is uh, labor crunch which is experienced in countries like Japan, Singapore, and markets where uh, it's aging population. So it's not as though they are displacing workers from their jobs. They can't even get workers to do the job. <laughs> so that's where they have a great pain point to want to automate the process, right? So that's point one. The other one is for countries that are uh, more, more developed, uh, or less developed, sorry, and the pay scale of price point is lower, and there are more people in, 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 in the job market, um, it's still a question of um, like what you said, the, the capability for someone to upskill a little bit and to supervise perhaps a fleet of robots to do the job. So at this point in time, we're, we are far from singularity. I think at this point in time, robots do jobs that are dull and dangerous. Yeah. Right? So in, in her use case, it's actually dangerous. Yeah. In our case, I would say it's dull. Mm. Right? We're doing jobs, our robots are doing jobs that actually um, no one will want to do usually if there's options. So I think at this point in time, it's really not a threat. Um, it is, of course, very sexy and very interesting to talk about these sci-fi predictions, but it probably will not occur in the next two generations, at least. That's good. Interesting. Thank you. So we only have two minutes left. Uh, very first. Um, this is going to be the last question I can have, maybe. Um, so from my experience, um, covering and interviewing uh, many startup founders, um, I think every single startup is facing um, challenge, challenges uh, at any time, maybe. But uh, for global this company like you guys, I mean, um, you guys are having much tougher problem in terms of the creating the software and the hardware at the same time, and then bringing the solution into the market kind of thing, right? So, yeah, it's very usual that um, the startups explain the, the looking at the many resources, including the um, talents or monies or um, any kind of things. That, but what 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 do you uh, really want right now, um, um, uh, specifically uh, among the investment or human resources or? Uh, any uh, business, business partnership, those kind of things. So what do you think? What, what, what specific the resource you want to have right now? Yeah, I, I think um, the simple answer is uh, partnerships are very important, mm. right? Because when you're a startup or you're a mid-sized company, um, and even these days, the large multinational companies, uh, they're looking for partnerships with startups <laughs> because they all realize that no one can be a domain expert for too long. There's always disruptive technology around the corner somebody will try and eat your lunch, right? And obviously, given the focus that most companies by default need to focus, so you need after some time to find other people, other companies to build strategic alliances and partnerships so that you can then move your business and grow beyond your, your current uh, sphere, right? Into new markets and so forth. So for Sesto, we strongly believe in partnerships. Uh, give one example is that when we deploy uh, our AGV solutions in the factory, which is overseas, uh, some of them demand almost on-site support, 24 by 7. So obviously, we can't send a Singaporean. Usually, Singaporeans don't want to be sent there <laughs> in these other countries. So we, we hire a, a team that is actually an outsourced party. Right? So we work with partners that, that provide these services 
So it can be also system integrators that provide uh, system integration services. So it ranges. But in a nutshell, having partnerships, having strong ecosystem is paramount for startups. Mm. I agree with uh, partnerships because nowadays, um, especially I, I feel it, this is very suitable for robotic developers. We need a pool of people developing stuff together. You can't develop things in silo, right? Uh, and robotics people are very good at that because most of our g the genesis of many robotics companies come from some sort of collaborative environments. So um, partnerships is great. The other thing is really about um, having visionaries um, who believe that robotics can truly transform the way that they are doing things is important because a lot of people that used to work in traditional businesses, they will say like, oh, why do I have to make this change? So it's only the visionaries that can see how robotics can truly transform their workplace. And that's, that's very important for any sort of um, full-scale robotic deployments. Mm. Maybe what I'll say is that um, looking at the startups around me, and having worked with startups uh, quite a long number of years, uh, what's interesting is that you see that the startups grow uh, just like a child. At different stages, they need different things, different nutritional things. From things that's just like their mother's milk to something a little bit more you know, solid and then to what we eat as human beings. So the same thing for the startup. I think at different points in their journey, they need different inputs from different partners, mm -hmm. be it partnerships from corporate or government or what have you. Uh, they need that talent pool that comes in at different points in time because as you're growing and scaling, then you're probably hiring your C CMO and the entire team. Um, you know, HR, because when it's five people, you don't need a HR really. Um, and to the point of when you're expanding overseas, you need the partnerships to go beyond your shores and what's your comfort, comfort level mm -hmm. and that right connections. I think that is something at a startup everyone goes through, regardless of whatever industry you're in. Um, and that's why I think working with people like uh, SG Innovate, for example, would be very relevant because that is the journey we take the startup through from you know very early stage up to a point when they're ready to take off. Okay. So time is up, so we need to conclude this panel with that. So thank you very much. So please give a round of applause to our awesome speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you.